Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Job, the man, had an experience. He went through too much for one man to endure in one lifetime. He lost all his children in one lifetime. He lost all his wealth in that same period. And after losing all of that, he became sick. He was afflicted with painful boils over his body. The woman that loved him got to the level of telling him, cast God and die. And I want you to know, that woman said that not because she did not honor God but because she was disturbed at the pain that her husband was going through. It's a painful thing to see your loved one going through all that pain and there's nothing in the world you can do to help them. This is the experience that this man went through. And then in all of these things that happened, Job opened his heart to ask certain questions before God. And interestingly, the question Job asks has been a question believers, the righteous, the godly, the saints, the children of God have asked themselves for centuries. And many of them have never gotten an answer. Or some have gotten answers, albeit in their own understanding. Some have concluded that these answers are from God. And fortunately, some are not from God. And some have received answers, but from where they were able to understand God. Somebody say amen. I always tell you that God relates, speaks, connects to you according to the level you are able to what? To understand Him. That is why He says, my son, in all I am getting, get understanding. Because when your understanding is elevated, His voice toward you will be elevated as well. When your understanding grows, his conversation toward you will grow. Somebody shout amen. He will increase his interest in speaking with you matters higher every day as your understanding increases. That's the essence of the word of God. As he speaks expressly by the person of Jesus Christ. This person of Christ has been made our wisdom. And because of that, as we connect and acquaint ourselves with his wisdom, God in his infinite grace, speaks to us deeply. Say amen. So in the 21st chapter of Job, the 7th verse, he asked a question that many Christians, many people ask. He said, Wherefore do the wicked leave, become old, yeah, and are mighty in power? He's saying, I am sickly. He was saying, I have lost my children. He's saying, I've lost my animals, he's saying. I've lost everything. And yet if I go back in remembrance, I have not done wrong to God. This is a righteous man. Even when God was speaking to Satan, he said, have you considered my servant Job? You understand? He said, there is none perfect like him. The man was living a righteous life. He was living a repentant life. He was living the right way. And lo and behold, sickness befalls him, his children die, he loses everything that he had made for years. And then, somehow through that, a window is open unto him to look at certain people, certain individual in his time. And then he has an observation that even as a righteous man going through this, he sees that the wicked live and become old and are mighty in power. And he said, their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offsprings before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear, 
neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not, their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. And they send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take the timbrel and, hop and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. This is what the wicked do. And then Job asks the question, What is the Almighty that we should serve him, and what profit should we have if we pray unto him? He's saying, what's the point of seeking God? Are you following what I'm saying? So when Job is going through all of these things, he sees another wicked man who has done no good at all and deserves death and destruction. And he sees that this wicked man is mighty. He sees that this wicked man is strong. He sees that this wicked man is wealthy. He sees that the children of that wicked man are established before him and their offsprings are growing before their eyes. He sees that none of their animals lose their young ones. Even the cows of the wicked give birth and have successful deliveries. He sees their children dancing with harps and sounds of organs and celebrating. And these people are living a full life, a wonderful life. And yet these are the people who tell God, depart away from us, we have no need of you. Now Job is asking the question, what's the point of seeking God? Are you following what I'm saying? And there are many people who go through too much. And as they go through too much, they compare themselves with people who are less righteous. Less serving, less available for God, less committed to the things of God, who are disconnected from God. And then they see these people prosper. They see their marriages prosper. They see their health is okay. They see them wealthy. They see them promoted. They see them go upward and upward. And they're saying, God, what is the point of seeking you? Who is this God that we are serving? That was the question. It went through the heart of Job. He thought about it. And don't be mistaken, many people have thought about the same questions that Job asked himself. It's a sad thing when you go through things and you get your eyes off God and yourself and then you start looking at another individual. But it happens because we have these promises. The word of God is always speaking that God will make us prosperous, we shall be a success, we shall be victorious in this world, His greatness for us, the lines are falling unto us in pleasant places, our paths are dropping with greatness, yes. But I'm seeing a fellow, he doesn't tithe, he doesn't give his first fruit, he doesn't do anything, he's even mean, but he's wealthy. And I've been giving, Apostle, I've been giving from day one, I've been serving from day one, I've been doing this from day one. Why would God bypass me and make that guy wealthy? What is the point of keeping myself? What is the point of being true to God? What is the point of going to church every Sunday, every Thursday? What's the point of being in His presence when I don't see the results of that presence? Ultimate question. And men who had encountered God went through the very things that I'm reading right now. And there are people who left the faith with those questions. When they did not receive answers, they left the faith. They detached from the presence of God. They detached from the love of their soul. They detached from the Almighty. They stopped attending services. They stopped going to church. And then you meet somebody. You ask them, hey, you're lost. What's wrong? I don't know. It's been about two weeks of depression. I could not leave my house. I was depressed. Why? Things are just not working for me. What did I do to God? And apostle, there are people I know who don't even love God the way I do, but they're successful. What did I do to God? Some people even ask, what did I do to God? In fact, some even say, what haven't I done? I've done everything in the book that requires God to at least have done something for me by this time. I have waited on God. I have confessed. I have fasted. The 40-day fast of this year, last year, I was there in every overnight. The rain hit me, and I still don't see results. And those are genuinely concerned people. But here, as a righteous man is being afflicted, and has lost everything. There's a wicked man whose children are growing, whose children are successful. And God has to go to the level of Job to speak to Job where he understands him. Are you following what I'm saying? God has to get to Job and say, okay, if you understand from here, let me speak to you from here. Because if you read the story of Job, Job questioned 
God and questioned God until he wanted to debate the integrity of God's word on his life. He started asking questions and started questioning God's interpretation and judgment concerning life. So when God sees that Job is made up to fight this thing, after everything is spoken, Job's friends have spoken, in fact, who misinterpret God's mind touching Job. God comes later with an answer in Job 38. And then he tells him, Aha, uh -huh, who is this that darkens counsel by the words without knowledge? In other words, he noticed a man who darkens counsel because he's speaking without understanding, without the words of understanding. Counsel was darkened. Okay? That means when a man does not speak, when a man does not walk in a certain understanding and in a certain revelation of God, he kills the thing in him that would counsel him. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. If you don't position yourself in the word of God, you start to kill the spirit that would tell you what to do, when to do it and how to do it. Never frustrate the spirit of counsel on your life. How do you darken the spirit of counsel? By disconnecting from understanding, by esteeming understanding lightly, by disconnecting from knowledge, by esteeming knowledge lightly. Tell me a man who has applied himself to the word as it is life, and I'll tell you a man whose well of counsel is constantly flowing to give answers and solutions. But tell me a man who prays when they want to pray, who believes when they want to believe, who fasts when they want to fast, who goes to church when they want and does not go to church when they don't want, you frustrate the wells of counsel. Sometimes you can go through something and think that you can never go out of it because in your own mind you can think of a solution and an answer and fail to get an answer. And it's possible. It happens in our times. Are you following me? But many times the answers are not far from us. The answers are not far from us. They are somewhere in the world. But many Christians do not know how to stay connected to the word of God, to his knowledge in a time when they are going through a crisis. I told people, regardless of a crisis, whether you have caused yourself or has been caused by another individual or a thing, never leave the presence of God that gives you knowledge and understanding. Never. Make every mistake in the world and still come and sit in your chair. Why? Because once you darken counsel, you will not hear the voice that tells you go this way. And it doesn't matter how fallen a man is. It matters that in the most fallen state, that man can still hear God. Who has understood what I just said? It doesn't matter in the most fallen state, that man should be able to hear God. So God answers him. He says, okay, God now your law is like a man and I will demand of you to declare. So he asks him questions. The foundation of the earth. Did you form the earth? Do you know how I formed the earth? Do you know how the earth moves in its circles? Can you show me where the pillars of the earth are? I'm imagining Job is stuck. He's stunned. He doesn't know what to do. Remember, God came in a whirlwind. Huh? And I think Job at that particular point thought God was going to kill him. He came in a sort of a tornado. And God puts him in the middle of a whirlwind. And he's talking these words. Imagine God talking these words in the middle of a tornado. You are in the middle of a tornado. And you're hearing God say these things. And if you're a reader of scripture, you will realize that his children were killed in a whirlwind. Huh? So maybe, just maybe, even the seeing of a whirlwind sort of traumatized him because he knows his children also died in a whirlwind. God puts him in a sack and says, uh-huh, who is darkening counsel? By speaking words without knowledge. <laughs> and everything is moving. I believe Job was stunned, shocked, afraid. Are you following me? And then he asks him, Aha, uh -huh. when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted, Where were you? Who shut the seas with the doors when it broke forth and issued out the womb? Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Have you explored the springs of the sea or have you walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of deep darkness? Where is the way where the light dwells? As for the darkness, where does it abode? He asked him questions. I can imagine God asking me those questions. Then he tells Job, you know what? You are so mistaken in who I am. You even lose the vision and picture of why these things happen to you. 
but for your own sake I will help you. Because I must fulfill what I promised on your life. I am God. And what did he do? After he gave that man double. And do you know how many people are using Job's experience to create a doctrine? You understand what I'm saying? I believe in the double blessing, but the double blessing does not come from Job's story. Christianity is not supposed to claim the double blessing from Job's perspective. Job's eye is not the eye of the New Testament. Are you following what I'm saying? In the Old Testament, the firstborn, the Bible says, was given double of the inheritance. And when Christ comes, he comes as the firstborn of them which are begotten after the time of redemption. When that Jesus comes as the firstborn among many, he comes with a firstborn anointing. And when we are born again, we are born in Christ. In him we live, move, and have our own being. And then the firstbornness of that anointing, resting on the person of Christ, is the very foundation through which we claim the double anointing. Meaning that every believer is supposed to be better than the best man in the world. That's the meaning. That every believer should be better at anything than the best there is in the world. That's what it means. But we don't get that. We don't connect that from Job's story. Praise God. Say amen. It happened also to the psalmist. He went through too much in Psalm 73. And he makes a very crazy confession. Give me the Amplified. Verses 2. And he says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. In other words, I almost left the faith. I almost disconnected from God and broke trust with him. A similar situation happened to the psalmist. And he got to a point where he almost disconnected from God and lost it and walked away from the rock of his salvation. The psalmist, yes, a man of God. He says, but as for me, my feet were almost gone and my steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the foolish and arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He saw it and he almost left God. So this thing I'm telling you is serious. There are many people Satan has tricked into disconnecting because of the successes they see with the men who are disconnected from God. Yet they don't see those results with them as individuals. So he says, For as envious of the foolish and arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they suffered no violent pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they smitten and plagued like other men. Therefore, pride is above their necks like a chain. Violence covers them like a what? Like a garment, like a long luxurious robe. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish, and the imaginations of their minds overflow with follies or foolishness. They scoff and wickedly utter oppression. They speak loftily from on high maliciously and blasphemously. They set their mouths against and spit down from heaven, and their tongues swagger through the earth, invading even heaven with blasphemy and smearing the earth with slanders. When I consider, he's trying to say, I have gotten to a place where I have examined a similar situation where he sees wicked people becoming stronger, becoming wealthier. Some even die well. You understand? Some of you have dealt with wicked people. If you haven't, me, I have. I've dealt with people in life where I almost thought, oh, what the devil is in this fellow? You understand? Have you ever met somebody and you start to think, is the devil in him or does the devil just overuse him? One of those two things. You understand? And when I was growing up, I too used to ask those questions. Not as one who would walk away from God, no, I knew better. But I used to ask myself, how can a man be so wicked and still live a good life? It's even worse for ministers. I've seen men of God who are so demonic. But they still have success. Their children go to school, they drive nice cars. You understand? They're even ordained in higher offices. I'm like, but God, aren't you watching? As this guy goes up, more people are going to be destroyed. You understand what I'm saying? And sometimes it's better you stay there and not come this side. 
Because when you come this side, oh, you see another world of crazy people. You see another world of crazy people. And some of the things some of us have gone through, I pray you never go through. You know why? Because if I had not seen God at a young age, I would have walked out of salvation. If I had not seen God at a young age, if not, I would have just disconnected from ministry. Because since as a child, I never liked the altar, I never liked the pulpit, I never liked attention. If I was in service, I would be sitting in the back. I don't like attention. I don't like it. You understand what I'm saying? The psalmist sees men that are troublesome, but are healthy, but are okay. Their eyes stand out with fatness. And he said, and these wicked people have more than their heart could wish for. Sometimes I look at some fellows on television and I see this guy has one billion dollars. And I want to hear him speaking. And he's too dumb. And I'm thinking, God, there's a pastor somewhere in Rusheri who is a good man. He loves you. He even sacrificed his children's school fees of the first term to build ministry. And there's a dude with a billion dollars on the account. And he's finding some of the most atrocious events of this world. Some of the most wicked events of this world. He's sponsoring campaigns and agendas that are destroying the world. And there's a very good man in Rusheri who loves the Lord. If he just had half a million, he would change a million people. Who is understanding what I'm saying? It's about to change. I said it's about to change. I said it's about to change. But it's about to change. The Lord spoke to me. You watch a few years to come. Things are going to start shaking and shaking and shaking to the direction of men who know what to do with wealth. Somebody said amen. I have seen that day. I have seen it. I have seen it. I don't know whether I can explain to you beyond the words that I'm speaking, but when you have seen, you have seen. There are things I saw when I was young and I've seen them come to pass. And this is as such. I see those days are coming where the church is going to be so rich, so blessed, that people will look at you and receive your God without you preaching. Why? Because he will position you in places where you have the answers. And not only the answers, but the answers with the results of those answers. You understand? Years ago I met a believer who was teaching about the coming kingdom, finance, wealth, something. And the fellow was broke. I wanted to counsel him and sit him down and tell him, brother, overkeep this book and this sermon until some things on you start making sense. You understand what I'm saying? I believe in a Christianity that has the results of what it says. Somebody shout amen. If you believe it, shout amen. So, this fellow sees that too. And he's disturbed. But by the grace of God, and I can only say by the grace of God, the psalmist knew how to seek God. Okay? And so he goes deep into understanding this thing. And in that very chapter, verse 16, the Bible says, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. He said to seek out and pain increased in his heart. And he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. In other words, until he went into the presence of God, he had not seen past what he was seeing concerning the wicked. Are you following what I'm saying? But when he went into the presence of God and sat in the sanctuary, because his heart was paining. Why are people rich and they are not using the money? Why are they successful? Why are they destroying? They are speaking malice. They are destroying other lives. They are slandering. Some people are so slanderous. They speak evil about you. And some of the stuff put on your life, some people will never know the truth. And there are people who are so in the realm of rumor and slander and gossip that whatever they tell them about a woman or a man is true. They never search out matters to know whether they are so. And then you see the fellow that slandered you and gossiped about you 
continuing to be successful. <laughs> and he's okay. He's still growing healthy. Are you following what I'm saying? So the man is pained because he had many enemies. David had enemies. And so when he gets into the presence of God to understand this thing, to get the full understanding, God carried his spirit and got the most successful wicked he knew. And then he carried David by the spirit and took him to the end of these men and showed him something he never saw. Because when you say, oh, their end is good, they die well. No, God took him beyond their death. Are you hearing me? It always works. It catches up. God took him beyond their death and showed him, look, they might enjoy life all the way through, but at one particular point, they have to answer. And when he saw their end, he was comforted. He says, surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How they are brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terror. He saw the end and realized it doesn't matter how good it looks. It doesn't matter how rosy it looks. It doesn't matter how beautiful it looks. It always has a bad end when it's wicked. That is where David or the psalmist was able to understand God. Are you following me? Then Jeremiah also goes through a similar situation. Sees the same observation. These are three men. But more in scripture have seen the same. And I believe almost every man here has asked themselves that question. Jeremiah 12 verses 1. He says, Righteous as thou, O Lord, when I plead with thee, let me talk with thee of thy judgments. He says, Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all they happy that deal very treacherously? They're treacherous and they're still what? Happy. Why is it so? He's asking the same question. And the Bible says, Thou hast planted them, yeah, they have taken root and they have grown, yeah, they bring forth fruit. Thou art near in their mouth and far from their reins. But thou, O Lord, knowest me, that thou hast seen me and tried my heart toward thee. Pull them out like sheep for the slaughter and prepare them for the day of slaughter. For how long shall the land mourn and the herbs of every field wither? For the wickedness of them that dwell therein, the beasts are consumed, the birds, because they said they shall not see our last end. And God shows that when wickedness hits a nation, even birds suffer. Even plants respond to wicked people. Did you know that? The land responds to wickedness. These trees, you see them, they're like standing. But when a man is wicked, there is a way when wickedness increases the nation. Trees can even dry up. That's just how much the spirit of wickedness is wicked. That it affects almost everything in the surrounding. And we should not take that lightly. That weathers can change because of wickedness. Climate can change because of wicked people. It moans too. It groans for the manifestation of the children of God. For the Bible says it was held in bondage against itself. Creation was held in subjection against itself. Somebody shout amen. That means when a man is righteous, when a man is connected to God, even his field will be green. Somebody shout amen. I told you that it's a principle law in the world that everything in the world is interconnected. Everything. Everything you see in the world is interconnected and it's possible for those things in the world to reject some people and accept certain people did you know that it's possible for nations to accept certain people and for nations to reject certain people even ministers of the gospel there are people even when they stand to minister the land says you can't you can't that's why it's okay. The land will not yield forth its substance. It's in the will of that land to respond to a man. Somebody shout amen. And may it be so favorable for you that the land, wherever you will go, whether you're in Uganda or you're in Europe or you're in America or you're in Asia, in every space the Lord will ever place your foot, you shall be accepted and favored above the people you'll find there. Shout amen. So when the Lord saw this fellow speaking, he also gave him an answer. And this is the one I want to establish my teaching on today. Because yes, he answered Job a certain way. He answered the psalmist a certain way. But I want you to hear how he answers Jeremiah. He says in the fifth verse, he's telling Jeremiah, 
Jeremiah has complained, kill them, get these wicked people, they are treacherous, but they are successful, they are increasing, they are prosperous, they are bringing forth fruit, their mouths are with you and they are dealing treacherously, but yet they are successful, kill them, destroy them, take them out. And God tells him in the fifth verse, if thou hast run with footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trustest, they worried thee. How then will thou do in the swelling of Jordan? What an answer. Underline that. The Amplified Version says, But the Lord rebukes Jeremiah's impatience, saying, If you have rest with men on foot, and they have tired you out, then how can you compete with horses? And if you take a flight in the land of peace, where you feel secure, then what will you do when you tread the tangled mess of jungle haunted by lions in the swellings and floodings of Jordan. Jordan used to have a period where lions used to come and fill the area and eat up the people. So he's trying to ask him, if you have run with men on foot and have become tired already and are complaining, will you run with horses? God can't ask Jeremiah such a question if he can't see Jeremiah run with horses. <laughs> Oh God! I said, God cannot ask him such a question if he does not see in him the ability to rest with horses and win. Let me justify this. If you remember the time of Elijah, you remember the time of Elijah? When there is no rain for three years and then he starts to pray? You remember? And when he's praying, the servant sees the cloud the size of the hand of a man in the sky, and then it, God tells Ahab, to buckle himself and run with his horses back home for I hear the abundance of the sound of rain. You remember that time? And the Bible says when it came to pass at that time, when Ahab got his horses to run, Elijah ran and outran the horses. Who has understood what I just said? A man of God once outran horses, yet in an inferior covenant. Please understand what I'm saying. Hallelujah. Yet with an inferior covenant. But he ran past the horses. A man is on horses. Are you hearing me? But there is a man on his feet running faster. Because there is something on his life that is not ordinary. That's why he's asking Jeremiah, if you are tired by running with men on feet, are you hearing me? If you are tired by running with men on feet, what will you do when you're supposed to run with horses? Because you will have to run with horses. He's trying to tell Jeremiah, you've feared quickly. You've given up quickly. You're shaking quickly. You've not seen yet what is going to come. And you have to be better. You have to run faster. Hallelujah. And he's telling him, if you are fearing right now and you feel insecure, in a land of peace where you're supposed to feel secure. If you're running from the place where you are supposed to feel secure. He says, how much more will you do when they throw you into the lions? Because he knows it's in Jeremiah to be thrown in lions and still make it out alive. To be thrown among wolves and come back leading the pack. To be thrown in the ground and buried and sprout out like a plant. Because he knows what is inside you. I wish you know who you are. Somebody shout amen. He says you are a chosen generation. A peculiar people. A strange people. If the Bible says he called out of his darkness into his marvelous light. That you should show forth the praises of him. Somebody shout amen. He's trying to tell you there is no easier way. But there are only harder believers. Somebody said hallelujah. There are only harder what? Believers. But when iron comes to bite, are you hearing me? Iron goes back and tells other irons that this guy is harder than iron. Somebody said hallelujah. Say amen. When you're thrown in the fire, you burn more than the fire itself. But the fire goes back and tells them, we thought we were burning, but that man burned. Somebody said hallelujah. Praise God. That is what he's trying to tell these men. He's telling them you're feared quickly. 
You've drawn back quickly. You're shaking so quickly. You've not seen nothing yet. What news can come? But how built are you? How steady are you? How composed are you? How much tenacity is inside you? That things will come and go and still find you hard. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. Psalm 34 verses 19, the Amplified Bible. He says, many evils confront the consistently righteous. Many. Many. Many things come to righteous men. So don't think that because you're righteous, stuff won't come. No. But God is trying to tell you what he's trying to tell Jeremiah. Do you not get him diagnosed with the worst disease in the world? And God tells you, now if you fear that one, what if the other one came? Who has understood what I just said? And then a man gets broke and loses everything and the landlord throws him out of the house with nothing. And he sleeps hungry for two days, three days. And God tells him, you're fearing that. What if what's happened? Tell your neighbor, Mukama Takuza Chejo. God does not pamper believers. Are you hearing me? He puts you in a position and tells you with this one, it doesn't matter how hard you go through, you can go through. Somebody shout amen. Shout amen. And he says many evils confront the consistently righteous, but the Lord delivers him out. I wish it ended there. Of them. Listen, God has said that what Whatever is ahead of you. Are you righteous? Are you the righteousness of God in Christ by faith? If you believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ by faith, he has said whatever will come. There's deliverance. Tell your neighbor, that's a divine attitude. God wants to raise a believer like that. That amid the worst situation, even when the worst comes out, you'd still say there could be worse. But even if the worst came here, my God will still see me through. That's the attitude of a believer. Oh, I was young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous for second. Neither they have seen begging bread. David says, I have never seen if you saw one then they are not righteous he said I have never seen the righteous for second no he seed begging bread give me the message version of that Psalms 37 25 he says I was once young now I'm grey beard not once have I seen an abandoned believer listen I read it again in the message. I was once young and now I am grey beard. He says, not once have I seen a believer abandoned. Tell your neighbor it's not going to start with you. Tell them it's not going to start with you. Ah! says yay in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ which strengthens me he will never abandon me he said I will never leave you nor forsake you he will never he will never abandon you that thing was never meant to kill you that thing was never meant to destroy you whatever it is I don't care its name God says it could have been worse but even at its worst there was still an answer for you hey! for brethren in all these things we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us verses 20 he says he keeps all his bones, the righteous bone. And he says none of them is broken. He says evil shall cause the death of the wicked. And they who hate the just and righteous shall be held guilty and shall be condemned. He says the Lord redeems the lives 
of his servants. And none of those who take refuge and trust in him shall be condemned or held guilty. God redeems his men of God. Oh, oh. Did he call you? Let them speak. Did he call you? Let them gossip. Did he call you? Let them slander. Did he call you? Let them hate. Did he call you? Let them write. Did he call you? Let them make meetings. Did he call you? Let them seek your life. Did he call you? Let them do whatever they want to do. Did he call you? Let them send witchcraft. Did he call you? Let them do the worst thing that a man could ever do. The Bible says the Lord redeems the lives of his servant. All you need is to know that you serve God. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know. All you need to know is that you're a believer in God. That's all you need to know. I don't care what you've gone through, woman. I don't care what has flipped you. I don't care how many mistakes you've made. Are you a believer? Are you a servant of God? Are you a child of the Most High? He is the Redeemer of His righteous. He knows how to get you out. And he must, because he should. Psalms 28, 8. He says, the Lord is their strength. And the Bible says, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. I wish to know what that scripture means. I said he's the saving strength of his anointed. Let me explain. God just doesn't save his anointed. No, he is the saving strength of his anointed. He just doesn't send salvation. He comes in the salvation. He just doesn't save in the healing. He comes in the healing. He just doesn't save in the deliverance. He comes in the deliverance. He just doesn't send provision. He comes in the provision. To tell you, look, not only have I sent your provision, but I am in the provision. Not only have I given you this marriage, I am in that marriage. Not only have I given you children, I am with your child. Not only have I given you money, I am in that money. Not only have I built a ministry for you, I am in the center. Let anybody bring it on! Somebody shout Amen! Oh, ye I wish you could shout for five seconds. I pity those who are quiet. I said I pity those who are just watching. Hey, glory to God. You will run with horses. For the horses are only animals and not spirits. Hey, you stand in the middle of lions and communicate a language that will turn their mouths away. That is the God that was with Daniel in the den of lions. The king comes out and says, Where are you, Daniel, O oh, servant of the Most High? And Daniel turns to the king and tells him, Long live king, for the Lord could not let any lion put its fangs on me. Why? Because he is my God. And the king said, From today, let the whole nation serve the God of Daniel. Some of you are about to go through things that men will just believe. I'm prophesying now. I say some of you, you're going to go through something that men will hear your story and just believe. You won't need to preach. The fangs will preach enough. The jaws of lions will preach enough. The gutters will preach enough. The chains will preach enough. The days will preach enough. The poverty will preach enough. The lack will preach enough. The disease will preach enough. Men will look at you and say, How did you make it? Tell your neighbor there is no reason to be afraid. Turn to them again and tell them there is no reason 
why you should lose sleep. There is no reason why you should lose appetite over those who will never understand you. There is no reason why you should lose peace over people who are made up to misinterpret you. There is no reason why you should waste your time explaining yourself to people who don't hold your destiny. There is no reason why you should appear right to people who do not impute righteousness on you, who did not set their blood on you. I have good news for you. He is your saving strength. He will help you. Listen, I've been through things. And some by their nature, I can never even stand here to tell you what they are. But the Lord told me this thing long ago. He told me grace. I anointed you. You have my oil on you. There is a mark of me. He told me you have my seal on your life. This is nothing. And I remember one day, I received very bad news. And I went in the presence of God and started to pray. And I found myself laughing. And I was not laughing from here. No. There was something in there. And I found myself, I could not stop laughing. And I laughed. And I laughed. Nothing physical had changed. Don't get me wrong. But I saw how big he was in me. And I saw how small this thing was. And from that day, never did I ever have a doubt in my heart that I had overcome. This is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Even our faith. Even our faith. Even our faith. I want you to speak in other tongues. No one like you. Jesus, no one like you. No one like you. Father, no one like you. No one like you. No one like you. Speak in other tongues. No one like you, Jesus. No one like you. No one like you. No one like you. No one like you, Father. No one like you, Master. You're the God. Hold me quiet. Speak another tongue.
your hands so I can say some words. I decree and I declare that the entrance of the word of God brings light and giveth understanding. And now counsel in the heart of man is as deep water as only the man with understanding can throw it out. And I feel that tonight you receive the understanding that you'll never be abandoned, that you'll never be forsaken, that you'll never fail, that he is the saving strength of his anointed, that men trust in horses and chariots, but you are a believer in God, that you'll not be weary by men on foot, but neither will horses weary you, that you will not fear in the land of peace, but neither will you seek in a land of turmoil and pain. I decree upon your life that you develop a hard mass, a life of faith, a hardness of backbone, that whatever will stand ahead of you, I am fully persuaded that you have conquered it already. It's the attitude, it's the mindset, the God who began that work in you and shall see to accomplishment to the day of Christ. It doesn't matter how proud, how big, I want to decree that greater is he which is in you. I say greater is he which is in you than he that is in the world. I believe that whatever is working against you is already defeated in the name of Jesus because you have the Alpha and the Omega, the present and the future, the beginning and the end, the creator of heaven and earth, the God that fashioned the world, the God that puts pillars into existence, the God that holds the earth without pillars, the God that commands the morning and speaks to the day, the God that calls the lions and the others to submit and yield to his word and his will. The God that speaks to mountains and they level. The God that raises valleys is working for you. He's working all things for your good because he loves you. He calls you. You're one with him and he. All things are working together for your good because you love the Lord and you're called according to his purposes. Your children will dwell in safety. Your life will be in safety. Your family will be in safety. Your ministry will be in safety. Your creation will be safety. Your dealings will be set. Your career will be aligned. Now if you believe that word, I want you to give him a mighty clap like you know that he is your saving strength. Hey! Come on! Come on! Thank you, Lord. Tell your neighbor there's nothing to fear. Tell them nothing. Nothing should shake you. Encourage them. Tell them nothing should shake you. Nothing. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Nothing should shake you. Nothing. Nothing. God's got this. Tell your neighbor God has got this. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is telling me something. There are people here who have had certain challenges, diseases, disorders, afflictions, challenges for more than five years. Anybody that has had something recurring for more than five years, say bye to it now. God is delivering somebody. I see devils leaving. I see devils leaving. Those things that stuck for long. Diseases that have been with you for long. Strivings and struggles that have been with you for long. They are cast. God is delivering somebody right now. Long term illnesses, long term witchcraft. God is delivering somebody. Long term struggles, addictions, anything that has existed with you. Go! In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today I've heard your word. My heart believes that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Finero, make manifest.